one of our members who's now left us has been working towards for a really long time. So he's been talking about the history of adult literacy in South Australia and trying to document it and all the people who were involved have been involved and putting it all together and it just seems to be that the time that she leaves the state we get to run it, <laughs> we get to do that. So uh, I'd like to thank Sue for having the energy still to be able to run this, organise this dialogue at the end of the year, this crazy time of the year already, as she's zooming off back to Ireland oh, tonight, I understand. Yes. And also to welcome and thank Jenny Carson for, it's like coming out of retirement, but to share all <laughs> of the fantastic experience, all the knowledge that she and a couple of the other of our guests tonight also have as far as adult literacy is concerned. So Sue, would, are you starting? Yes. Briefly. Thank you. In my day, we would have booked a DVD with a t no, a video recorder with a television screen, which would have been in the room, and the plugs would have been missing when you went to turn them on, or the TV wasn't there when you went to use it. <laughs> it's it's true that. When I was driving in here, I thought about Jenny and the things that we did in the late 70s and 80s, and I realised having a PowerPoint was just, what, why? Why would you do these things? <laughs> so I'm conscious that there's also a group of people that are going to be possibly watching this streamed via SACAL TV, as Michelle called it. So that's really great. It might mean, though, that for those of you out there in the, the virtual land, that some of the bits and pieces don't quite make sense. But we'll try and... Um, keep it flowing along. So thank you. Thank you all for coming along. Um, as, as Michelle said, I'm Sue Shaw and uh, I think I described it as doing 23 years of hard labour at the University of South Australia before I moved recently to uh, Charles Darwin University to take up a position in research. And I, I am actually really delighted to be in the School of Education there but also to have a bit of time to be thinking about this project that has taken up my mind for a number of years, but I know that a lot of you in the, in the room tonight too have been engaged in literacy for way more than 10, 15, even longer years. And so tonight, what, um, what we're doing, the plan is to just invoke some memories and to try and surface some of the untold stories, a very small selection of them. But we also, I also have brought along, and Jenny has too, some what we're starting to call artefacts of the field that we hope will prompt more memories from you. <coughs> from you. So there's a bit of time in, in near the end of the session when we want to put things out on the table and get people talking about what, what these artefacts mean to you and what things they invoke for you. Um, I wondered why I put 1990, um, uh, but I, then I realised that that was International Literacy Year, I or Y. And it seemed like there's a lot of stories that much of, of what we know about adult literacy before 1990 is kind of hidden. It's um, silent, not quite invisible. Um, and yet for a number of people that I can see in the room, it's actually very visible in your garages <laughs> and boxes under beds and in your cupboards and on top of cupboards and behind cupboards um, and, in, and in your heads as emotions and memories. Um, and that's, I think, the exciting part of this idea of telling some stories and unpacking boxes of stuff about what we've got about adult literacy practice in South Australia. The other thing that uh, intrigued me is the amount of time that I've had contact with people in the eastern states or in the north or in Canada or the UK and the way that they tell the stories of adult literacy in their places and how very, very similar they are but also how, how different 
things unfolded here in South Australia for particular reasons, through particular organisations, with particular people, with particular policy strategies that we adopted. And, and also at the time, how South Australia led the way in particular policy and curriculum initiatives. <coughs> and so I think that that's also um, you know, really interesting stories worth telling. But this is what the archive first started to take shape as. Ba plastic bags, um, boxes of stuff that people were giving me because I'd say, you can't throw that out, that's really important history. Okay, well you have it, Sue. <laughs> so I ended up with boxes and boxes of stuff, hence the title. Um, so this project is a, is a project in progress. It hasn't actually even formed yet, I don't think. We certainly don't have any funding for it just yet, but as you'll see today, you don't actually need funding to start telling really interesting, interesting stories. I also owe a debt of um, huge gratitude and thanks to Mary Hamilton and Von Hillier, who took up this project in the UK with the help of about £250,000 from the, from the UK government um, and produced a, a book and a, a website and a whole range of um, products from, from that project called the Ch and they called it the Changing Faces Project and it documented the history of a um, particular kind of history in the UK of adult literacy. So if you're ever interested in that, Google won't Google the Changing Faces Project in the UK. And it's quite, quite interesting, I think. One of the things that I've talked to Mary and uh, Yvonne about, though, is that they haven't, didn't get to the stage of digitising much of their work. And I think that's the, that's the trick for our project. That would be really nice. And in, in, in trying to digitise and put on the web for practitioners some of the material that's available, but I can see Josie Misko in the audience who's, who works for NCVER thinking, that's a big project. It costs a lot of money. I met with NCVER colleagues last week, three of them, who convinced me that it's a very big project uh, and involves a lot of questions about what you digitise, how you do it, who does it, what kind of quality is, is gained, and then what's the purpose for doing it in the first place? The history is... <laughs> for, those, for those of you out on the web in SACAL TV land, Trish Brands and Linda Are have joined us and um, they're, they're right, the history of literacy has walked in. Linda and Trish have been involved in literacy for, for de literally decades. Okay, so one of the things um, that prompted me to really get moving on this project was getting the job in Darwin and thinking what the heck am I going to do with all of this stuff? Um, I, I, there, there were, there's no one here who was in a position to be able to do the kind of research or have the funding for it, but I put it together in boxes and ended up with about 33 boxes. And I was talking to um, Mary Hamilton and Yvonne Hillier about what do you do with boxes? How do you start the beginnings of a project? So here's what some of it looks like today looking at some of the themes that they identified and looking at some of the material that was in those boxes as I packed them away. So that some of the themes were about who works in adult literacy, who have been some of the people in the field, who have been some of the people who've, who've been very public figures and who have been the people who, to use my expression, beavered away slowly and so, almost silently. The, the underground people who've just got, got on with doing the work. What were some of the ways we communicated about adult literacy to the wider public and to people? Assessment and moderation. Some of you have seen the, uh, an earlier, pro uh, earlier presentation that I did on the early days of assessment, and I've probably got a couple of slides to remind us of that here. What did student work look like? There's a real issue about that too. What kind of student work is it ethical and proper to show in a public domain if the students are... Um, uh, named if they are publicly identifiable in a project that hasn't asked for permission from them. So that's just <coughs> one small aspect of the ethical dimensions of the, of the work that we've still got to explore really. Uh, news and media coverage, well that's out there in the public domain. So, and as you'll see from Jenny's terrific looking presentation, she's got a really nice range of media material to help us understand what it was like to, look, to talk about literacy in the early days. Uh, state and national strategies, as I said, 
South Australia was involved and actually took the lead in some really remarkable strategies through the late 80s and 90s when we have to be careful to say that was the golden age when there seemed to be a lot of money, but there certainly seemed to be a, a different kind of money channeled towards different kinds of activities then. And institutional reports. I've, um, I noticed that when Yin Chan Lee's has come in from the Workplace Education Services, which it might still be called now, I came across the first report by Bob Bean from WES in 1989, I think it was. And one of the problems with this project is that I take a piece of an artefact out of a box and start reading it and then look at the other 33 boxes and think, can't do that now, can't, can't read now. But I couldn't resist having a quick look at the first uh, workplace education report and thinking some things haven't changed at all and some things are radically different. One of the pieces of advice that uh, Mary and Yvonne gave me was that, uh, like myself, people have a, a real attraction to some of the material that they've kept. There's a real emotional attachment to it. So how do you recognise that emotional attachment and almost a, a collection of a person from the, pit, from the field? And what this um, page here shows is a way in which they help to un understand how to label and document that and keep what they call the provenance, um, the origins and the lineage of the material that you've collected. So just there, the labels on these boxes say PC, which stands for personal collection. So there's an NC, national collection, there's an SC, state collection, there's a PC, personal collection. Um, oops, my, there's an MH, so this comes from the personal collection that Mary Hamilton donated I have no idea what the grey label means, but it's the fourth box. Um, and what you'll find in our collection at the moment is that there's a personal collection from Linda R.A. who gave me one of those plastic bags of stuff <laughs> and, a, and an orange folder, and Jackie Plas Parslow who also gave me a bag of stuff. Hello, come in. One bag? Yes. Only one bag? What do you do with the rest, Jackie? It's still there. Oh. There were, there were also two boxes of material that when we had the state adult literacy unit, there was a, a huge amount of material there, but two major boxes that are identified as key reports that have come out of that project. So for those of you who are wondering, what would this look like, or what would I do, or I've got some material, but I'd like it to, to be somehow connected maybe with, the, with my history in the field, then one of the ways that that can be done is to talk about how you've donated a, a collection, a box. Um, from the work that you've done. And in fact, for most of the people, all of the people even in the room here, I, I would hope that you'd be looking at the material that you've written and the work that you've done, and that could be a way for you to donate your personal collection, not necessarily to this, but to identify as material that you've got. So I think you'd be a fabulous person to do that. So, so Without further ado, uh, what we thought we'd do is start off with Jenny Carson talking a bit about some of the personal collections, collection that she has and the, the memories that she's got of the very early days of adult literacy. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks, Sue. Well, well, I mentioned as I came in the door that I feel like a, a, um, an archive that's actually still alive, but there's a couple of other... <laughs> around the place too. <laughs> and Linda, you'll be very pleased to see that oh. some of it lives on. Um, well, when Sue, when Sue asked me to um, to speak to you people tonight, she posed a few sort of ideas for discussion. And I'm just going to go through, as she suggested I speak, um, in order of the sorts of things she wanted me to sort of say about perhaps my background. And one of the first questions was, what was my first job? And I thought about that, and it was actually as an usherette at the Udunda Picture Theatre at the age of 16, when we young girls who were going to the city to do our studies as teachers, college students, we were still rostered on and had to come home on the train when it was our turn to be an usher at the pictures, for which we got a free ticket. So that actually was my first job that I had to be at, um, and be at regularly. So I was actually training to be an infant school teacher at Western Teachers College at the time, 
and then I was appointed to Mintero Primary School where I was in, um, I was it with classes one, two, three and four and the principal of the school taught the rest. Came to, back to the city and taught for another uh, perhaps seven years, ending up at Prospect Infant Demonstration School. And then I stopped everything, had some baby, or had a baby, and resigned, of course, as you had to do in those days. And then in 1976, we get on to the what prompted me question to join the ranks of adult literacy provision. It really didn't prompt me, it dragged me in. I had a phone call from an ex-colleague who was working at the Reading Development Centre, which I think was in Sturt Street at the time. And she said, I've just had a phone call. Hello, Jenny, I've just had a phone call. She got straight into it. From the Head of General Studies at Elizabeth Community College. And he's got a list of people's names that he doesn't know what to do with because they've come along to enrol in pre-matriculation English, but they can't seem to read or write. And he doesn't know what to do with them. So could you go out and see him? So I put the baby in the pusher and out I went. And yes, he did have a great long list of names. And yes, they'd come into the Elizabeth Community College, as it was then, to try and find some way of getting back into a system that would help them with their current literacy problems. So he said they can't go into it. They can't go into pre-matric because they can't read or write. And I mean, I was really staggered because I thought, well, who are they? What, why couldn't they read or write? You know, they, are they from a non-English speaking background? I mean, all those terms were new to me. Or were they in some way disabled? What was the problem here? Anyway, the answer he thought was, perhaps if I could write a course called How to Learn to Read in about 10 weeks, he thought that'd be about right. And, and I thought, well, yes, I suppose, based on my junior primary training, yes, I could probably do something about that, maybe with a little bit of help from somewhere. So I had the reference point of my friend in the Reading Development Centre who, who sent me to the Wattle Park Teachers um, Resource Centre. And I had somehow got some published material from the BBC reading um, program that was just starting up in England and there was a sort of a manual which was given to me by some people from Spelled. I was told that Spelled might be able to help me and to, to the director there and, 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 and the teacher invited me into their classroom with this BBC book that might help me in my preparation work to write my course. So off I went, still not knowing how on earth this is going to happen, but I did write a course. How, and I think I called it How to Read in 10 Lessons, because I knew it wasn't How to Read in 10 Easy Lessons, it was going to be how, just 10 lessons. And um, I subsequently spent hours and hours and hours on 10 lessons. I can't show you a copy of that, which is a real shame for the archives because I never kept one. Because it went out the window on, on the next stage of my, um, my journey. Um, because I had a baby and a preschooler while I was doing this research, between naps and feeding and walks to the shop because I didn't have a car, I wrote my course for no recompense whatsoever. Nobody paid me anything for that. And then, of course, the big question came along, would you like to pilot the course? Pilot the course. Now, I'd come from junior primary school, and piloting courses wasn't in <laughs> my vocabulary or my understanding, nor was uh, a community college. All I remembered it as was sort of night school, because I hadn't been involved in it. Anyway, pilot the course I did. And so, I have a photograph here, which you can have a look at later, which tells the story of how things were in that very classroom. 
The setting is my first classroom at Elizabeth Community College, a cold, lonely, this is what I wrote in my scrapbook, a cold, lonely block down near the railway line with few resources and even my own coffee mugs and as I, my daughter pointed out the other day and laughed and said, I remember that Tupperware milk container <laughs> and some international roast coffee. Three very disinterested students who did agree to having their photos taken. Uh, the other six in my class did not want to be photographed by the advertiser's photographer. Writing was difficult because we weren't offered any desks or anything. We were in, I think, some kind of a lounge setting, nothing to write on or with. Um, so writing was really attempted. Such was the lot of PTIs in the 70s with small groups like these proudly attending night school but choosing to remain anonymous. That was taken by the advertiser as part of a well, sort of an expose on what was going on at Elizabeth College, never published because it wasn't really as important as um, uh, boiler making then and uh, electrical and um, probably some business studies. So it never, never made the reports. But it's a very, I think it's, it really depicts what my starting point was back in 1976. Um, I do recall that my first lesson, as they walked into my classroom, one of these young people was pushed in by his mother. She said, you're going in, get in there, get in there. And she pushed him in the door. And he, he had, like his knuckles were like this, with a book in one hand and a, and a pencil in the other. I had another young woman who was a, whose parents had been a tinker, a tinkers in Ireland. And she had a book that she was going to write in, which was one of those that we learned to write in when we were in junior school with the two faint lines and the two dark ones. And she found that somewhere in her collection and she thought that would probably be quite useful. Um, so lesson one was all about signs around us. And I'd been around taking photos of Elizabeth signs, like there was John Martin's and stop signs and you know just things that we need in the area. And um, lesson two was going to be about newspapers I do recall that, and lesson three was using the telephone book and the street directory. And so the whole lesson was going to be on those subjects. Well, lesson one, the whole course went out the window. When I had 12 people in the room, none of whom would have done any of that, and we had to start wherever they were. And that's where my junior primary school teaching, it's all I had. I didn't have any training in adult learning, adult uh, teaching methods. And I went from where they were at, frantically writing down, what do you want? You know, I could hear myself saying, what do you want to do? One lady wanted to read the Bible. And that was a common thing in those days in, in the community things. A lot of people had extraordinary objectives that were not all that meaningful at that particular time. But that's what their, you know, their, their long-term goal was. Um, there was a couple of employment issues. Even in those days, somebody wanted to become a supervisor and couldn't do the form. So, you know, the individual needs programs were becoming evident to me in that very first encounter. The other thing that many people wanted to do then was to write. They couldn't write. They wanted to learn the alphabet. And I wanted to start at the beginning. I just want to start at the beginning. You know, all of them thought that there was a beginning to this lesson of life that they were engaging in. And um, so another book came to the fore. And I never kept that one either. That was Improve Your Handwriting. And I did that on a Spirax type of thing where you flipped it over. And we started with the letter A. And we did it in cursive, and we then did some rows. I mean, it was it was sort of pretty demeaning in a way, but I thought it would possibly help. So, so I did that. So, so that was my starting point, and from then on, I spent the following oh, twenty something years, and I started off by teaching 
in my own home. Uh, then I got into community literacy um, with Anne Davenport, whom many of you would know. And Anne and I were it at, at, at Elizabeth, um, finding, a, finding a desk each down in a little corner and our only place to uh, store things was on two window ledges. We didn't have anywhere, to, no cupboards, no space like that. Well, that area then went to a staff room, so we were homeless again and got a desk into another corner. So things weren't easy without um, a real place to call our own with a telephone. We finally got to that. Um, I, I think we're probably at 1977, 78 or thereabouts. And I've got this great article that um, you can have a look at, which was, uh, Bob Wilson was the, the spokesperson at the time. This was in the advertiser. And I was very interested when I started looking at some of these, at, at some of the headlines and the language of the day that was there for the people out there to, to read. Help, I can't read. Words like crisis, crisis. Um, uh, that's a cry that could be made by 875,000 adult Australians. The figure kept being published and it kept growing. Each time a, a, you know, a year went by there was another figure which was more. Um, but this one, this one is quite good because it has the signs on it that I was really keen to teach in that first lesson like calamine lotion. Do not litter. Fine. Max, max hundred dollars. Stop. Rat kill. Poison. No U-turn, keep left. You know, those were the signs that I actually took way back in 1976 that I thought might be useful in the first lesson. So that's a really interesting starting point for me. And Bob was also a starting point for me in the area of tutor training, because I'd never done a tutor training program. And so I sat in, in one of his at one stage, and then I, I was responsible for tutor training in, um, in the Elizabeth College. I always remember, Bob was very interesting in his early presentation days. It was all, it was all very lively, wasn't it? Those of you who remember it. I can remember him giving a spelling test. And one of the words was Presbyterian, and one was chrysanthemum. <laughs> and he then, people, were, these are the trainees for the job of being a tutor, a volunteer tutor. And some of them were going aghast, you know, because they're not really easy words to spell. But then he would give you some other words, like one was pinning. Pinning. And that's the only one I can remember. It wasn't a word, but it was based on the fact that you would know what the, what the style of the word, the sounds of the word, and you would figure that it's a double M and so on and so on. And there was a spelling test based on those kinds of words, which was a way, I suppose, of teaching teaching adults who were going to be helping another adult to get back to some form of a, of a starting point. So Bob had a lot to do with um, getting Anne and I into the jail. We took some tutor training sessions in the Attila, which was pretty scary stuff, but Anne and I went off to the Attila and did a couple. Um, and, we, and we did a lot of tutor training in the mostly in the northern suburbs, which then led to the community literacy programs and you know, the, the um, arrival of community houses and community coordinators and so on. So a lot of it sort of went out um, as the program you know, gained in momentum. Um, so then I taught in lots of adult literacy classes at Elizabeth and some at Teacher Gully, I think. Um, Without my CV, it's buried in a box somewhere. I can't remember the dates, but um, there was a lot of teaching going on at Elizabeth at that time. And in 1990, as Sue referred to, International Literacy Year, um, I, it was just quite interesting. It, I found that um, there was quite a broader range of um, organisations that took an interest in literacy at that time, one of which was Rotary. My husband was a Rotarian and the district that we were in um, 
District 950 actually contained, and our club contained the district governor, who was very interested in adult literacy. So I went on to the Rotary District 950 literacy, Adult Literacy Committee, and as a result of that I spoke to 10 Rotary Clubs, which meant that the message was going out to another range of people, in those days all men, because um, only men were members, but they often made it a ladies' night, and so there were lots of, the, you know, the, the web sort of crept out a little there. And I found a, a, um, an invitation to uh, a Rotary-sponsored adult literacy tutor training program, and that was to be held over five weeks, and, uh, and I conducted that. And I, I, I like some of this language. The whole the language of how we spoke about it was quite interesting. Please feel free at any time to question or clarify any points. The training program hopes to model many of the methods and strategies used when helping adults with reading and writing. One such important strategy is to keep material relevant to students' needs. In a sense, you are students of mine as you take part in this program. You, therefore, are entitled to have some say as to its content, direction and practice. Now, you know, I can't imagine that I would have been <laughs> condescending, really, but um, I guess it had to be there because people had to know in, at that level of the, uh, sort of the community um, and the people that were engaging in it, and some of them did take on students out there in their rotary districts and so on. Um, you had to sort of um, get them to really remember who, who their student uh, or what they're going to be needing and I was trying to sort of say to them then you might be needing something too and um, I might have to adjust my program for you. Um, my next big thing was workplace education and um, especially at Holden and I started working in Holden under some quite difficult circumstances with very noisy classrooms, very some of them very disinterested students who were there because um, the organisation said they had to be. Um, so it was very difficult work um, with a variety of um, cultural backgrounds. I knew sometimes um, some of them were a little bit anti each other in the classroom and it showed and I would be right in the middle of it all and just trying very hard to just do my two hours there. All of my um, assessment work was done out in the plants which explains why I'm half deaf. Um, so I can remember doing an interview one foot either side of the production line talking to a person on the line who wasn't freed by his supervisor to have an interview somewhere quieter. So the line's going there and I'm going like this and there's racket everywhere. So they were difficult times. As a result of that, I joined NALQ, which was the national, I had to remember this one, the National Adult Literacy and Language um, Communication Unit. And what made it national was Mitsubishi and Holden. It was all Eastern States. And my counterpart at, um, at Mitsubishi and I used to fly over to Melbourne every month for a NALQ meeting. We were offered accommodation in the coordinator's caravan out, the, out in the back of her house. And we said, no, we're not going to do that. So she said, oh, well, I can't put you up in a hotel but you can't have separate rooms. And he said, that's okay, we'll share with them. So every month, I'd have the double bed one month and, and she'd have the single bed and then the next month she'd have. And we used to get the same room because we put a marker in the Gideon Bible to see whether somebody could get it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, normally it was in the same place. <coughs> but um, they, that was a very interesting part of my teaching life because um, we two South Australians were doing very, very well over here in the world of workplace education. And they thought they were doing a lot better than 
their counterparts over the border. That's the, that was the reality of how they perceived themselves. But we used to stand up and say our piece and people would actually say, oh, would you like to just say that again? That's a very interesting point. Are you doing that? So we'd say yes, and I'd say yes, but Holden would prefer that we didn't disclose any more of that. That's, um, that's uh, for their, you know, their information only. And my counterpart at Mitsubishi would withhold too. Because we knew we were doing things very, very well. So how am I going? Is it too, am I going too slow, fast, or whatever? Are we going all right? Um, so did you get a timeline? Well, it's, it's quarter to, to six. Is she going all right? Well, yes, it's 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 yeah, yes. Yeah, it's it's very interesting. I think it's going um, well. Since then, I'm nearly finished, but, but I do, because I do want you to have a look at some of these things. Um, uh, once again, really looking at the language as, we, as, as it was spoken. I think there's a lovely article by Trish Branson here, which was the installation of adult literacy curriculum for adult literacy learners. It's all very good. The other thing, just getting back to Rotary, it was very interesting that Rotary actually sponsored the SACAL newsletter. My, my husband's Rotary Club sponsored the newsletter for some time, and that was, a, that was during 1990. And also, I noticed, and you would remember this, Trish, at a recent seminar for volunteers held at the Elizabeth College of TAFE, SACAL was the delighted recipient of the generous donation of $1,500 from the Zonta Club of Adelaide Flinders. And they actually, I've even got this too, they actually sponsored the conference in the International Literacy Year State Conference, that was the SACO one of course, um, and, and they, and they uh, it's in there somewhere that the, the sponsorship was um, uh, really valued from Zonta. And I know I spoke to a Seroptimus Club or two in those days too. So three service clubs became very interested and concerned about um, adult literacy provisions. Um, my last five years were in the field of open learning uh, at Para Institute, then Regency. I've got about eight badges, that, that, and I know Jackie's got, you've got more, I think. <laughs> but mine are in the very bottom of the very bottom of the box, and I couldn't find them. Um, and that was redesigning and producing learning materials for all of the faculties that needed them at, at Elizabeth. And um, I had some dreadful material to work on, photocopies of photocopies of photocopies of Romeos, of Gestechners and so on. And when, when a little more formal approach to apprentice training was introduced, then matters like learning outcomes had to be addressed and some of the lecturers didn't really know much about them. So I did a lot of work with that. And, um, and did a lot of writing and instructional design for learning materials at Holden for the Vehicle Industry Certificate, which was introduced during that time for production workers to actually um, be um, allowed to receive instruction and pass certain points which would enable them to earn more money. So it was recognition that had never been done before. <coughs> now I must mention one of the other questions that, um, or things that Sue asked me to address was, was there any person or people or resources that um, were instrumental in my practice? And I wouldn't dare to mention any of the adult literacy practitioners that I worked with because we were all pretty super, super human beings. <laughs> and we were all great friends and we were all um, very happy to meet together, share our resources. Um, uh, and, and it was a terrific bunch of people to, to work with. So they were all very instrumental in my practice. But I would like to mention the late Marie Jasinski, who some of you may know. Um, she was appointed as the councillor at Elizabeth, and she was very instrumental in getting new things happening, and hence the opening of the Open Learning Unit. And each faculty was, um, we had to apply, 
and each faculty um, released one practitioner to join the open learning program and I was lucky enough to be the um, general studies one. And we did a training program with her for six months and then I took on the role of coordinating the, the second six months. So I was, that's when I actually left um, adult literacy or what prep as it was then. But she was an inspiring person who could bring out the best in everybody. And she certainly, for me, created opportunities for me to do well in things that I never thought I'd even do at all. So I owe her a lot and um, I know many others do too. She was a wonderful, wonderful educator and mentor. One of her lovely quotes, which she said often was, it is better to ask forgiveness than to ask permission. And really that, that I think is a, is a fantastic um, ideology for us to go by because sometimes you just had to take the bull by the horns and go for it and and it was easier to say, look, I'm sorry, it didn't quite work out, we'll try it all way. <laughs> <coughs> now the big, pardon me, the biggest change in the field since first starting my work, I think when I left, things were looking a lot more like, um, think, uh, the, the programs are much more geared towards employment and um, matters relating to uh, progression and entry points and that sort of direction. Um, we as practitioners were constantly engaged in curriculum matters, curriculum launches. They were very new and very exciting. And they hadn't been there in those early days. Um, national standards, budget restraints, I don't suppose they've gone away. <coughs> Policy developments, those, those kind of more formalised uh, matters relating to our practice were, um, well, very, very um, essential to where we were going from there. And the, and the community literacy programs were also very well underway. Many of them were struggling and personnel was getting very weary of, of the struggle, um, and yet they still tried very hard to, to um, provide what the, the people in the region needed. And I'd just like to, to end with this quote that I loved when it happened. And I often wonder now how many current practitioners would, would um, enjoy the pride and the, uh, the, I suppose, the heartwarming, as it was to me then, comment. So, so I did when one of my, I can still see him, hair everywhere, um, um, check shirt, jeans, you know, you burst into my classroom and he said, guess what, Jenny? This week I bought a dictionary instead of a six pack. <laughs> and I, I've never forgotten that because it really meant a lot to me and I thought, this is why I do what I do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so look, that's about it, I think. And, and I've got some interesting things here that I, I'd like you to look at the, the language that was used. Um, and I've highlighted some of it, um, and, the, and the dreams of people, like Mrs. Whitlam. She was present at the launch um, of the 1990 Literacy Year here in Adelaide. Margaret Whitlam wants to see the eradication by the year 2000 of illiteracy, a problem that affects more than one million Australians. She wanted to see, the, <laughs> to see it eradicated as did one of my directors, I know. When is this the literacy thing going to end? And I've got a lovely photo here. Oh, I've just, sorry, I've just passed, is that, I've just passed it round. No, that's all right, that's all right. No, I've got a photo of a, of the photo that, of the, um, the photo of, oh, it's not here. I'll find it. It's a photo of a poster that was, a huge poster that was billboarded. <laughs> and I put it up with great oh. difficulty <laughs> in our learning resource centre. Not there, isn't it? Yeah. That gets the photo. I put this poster up and it took me about an hour and a half. And it said, this poster, and I've got it here somewhere. This poster is for the one million five, we've got up to one million five hundred thousand people in Australia who can't read full stop. Yet full stop. Mm. <clears throat> and my head of school then came 
called me over and said, Jenny, that's not a very good advert, you know, for, for literacy because yet isn't a sentence. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for listening. I hope it's been interesting and um, have a look at what I've got. Thank you. I actually think it would be worth getting people to think a bit about what Jenny's talks prompted for them before I go on to some of the things that I was going to say. Because as I was sitting there, I started just having visual flashbacks for you know, 15 years of my life. <laughs> some of it, so yeah, yeah, I, yeah, no, I mean 15 years of that particular time. So I'm just wondering whether Jenny's talks prompted particular memories from people. I started, think, I started thinking about Brian Stanford, mm. who was the principal of the Adelaide mm. College mm. of Tape, mm. as it was yeah. then called, who was what you'd call now a champion of adult literacy, mm. even though at the time he also had to run a tape and so <laughs> presented right. us with many particular <laughs> challenges in himself. But, mm. you know, without, without Brian, adult literacy would have had a, a much harder. Mm. Yeah, when you... Um, Jenny, I don't know whether you remember me. I joined uh, Workplace Education Services uh, in 1991, but it's really the year of the uh, International Year of Literacy. Yes. And I think that that year is so critical because for adult literacy, that um, the national government, I think that this is the Labour government at that time, they, they have been in adult literacy policy. Mm -hmm. And under mm -hmm. that, they take away the 4% English in the workplace mm -hmm. funding with the uh, adult literacy funding to form the uh, workplace, the WELL program. Mm -hmm. And this year is the 20th year of uh, <coughs> birthday, okay? Yeah. So I was invited to make a speech at the WELL uh, birthday conference or whatever. Yeah. But it's interesting to, to look at look back, is that really that year why it's critical because it is a company that combined English language and literacy. Mm -hmm. And then um, I know that, and then in 1991, we had the literacy and productivity conference. And I think that Trish, you, you were one of the speakers, and I'm sure that you, Jenny, you were one of the speakers. And I, Mike Rand, I look at some old things, Mike Rand actually was our, the state's minister for further education and employment, yeah. you know, something around that, you know. And he was one of the, uh, the speakers yes. in the Literacy and Productivity yes. Conference. And so I think that South Australia is quite leading the way. But why I say 1991 is so critical because of the uh, having this well program is a milestone because it combined English language and adult literacy. For quite a number of years, it has really been a battleground between ESL teachers and adult literacy teachers. I, I was always the one who caught in the middle because I don't belong to, I don't think I belong to anyone camp. Um, and then it wasn't until probably late, early, late, 19, uh, early, late 1990s that sort of like settled a bit. So I think that uh, identity of adult literacy was blurred a bit after that. I don't know, but it's just a quite, quite, quite a critical time in the 1991. Well, that's why I sort of finished my. I mean, I went on working after 1990, but that's why I perhaps tried to focus a little on 1990 because it did. Yeah, it's a it, it really was a critical year. Really um, critical. And exactly. and there was a lot of. It's interesting. There's a lot of. Um, Headlines here that we cut out and kept from that year, um, which you can also have a look at. And and this, uh, I think you, you've got the one that's been passed around. The around with the tape, tape what's going on. Yeah, it's interesting yeah. that personnel there in your in the the, um, uh, the photo that you're in Linda at the launch. Yes, Mike Brown is the minister mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. with hair. With hair, <laughs> brown, 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 brown hair. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. Actually, one of the really interesting things is to watch how the fashions and the hair change. Okay. Whenever I've shown people Together photos with from the archives, yeah. Yeah. one of the first things they say is, "Oh, look at my hair!" Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's quite interesting to see how we dressed in particular ways, and how the how the community people dressed, yes. and the workplace people dressed, mm -hmm. and the TAFE people dressed. Well, my daughter yeah. said to me, "Are you going to do the Jenny Carson TAFE thing? Have you still got new things with shoulder?" And I said, if I had high heels, I'd fall over. And now I haven't got any shoulder pads. So, what you know, a scarf. and a scarf. Mm. Oh, and a scarf. And you would have liked it if I'd done a few things in clouds. So I was like, don't do that. I was, I was at cloud. Every time anybody walked into my classroom, there'd be things in clouds on the board, on the blackboard, or the whiteboard. Okay, well, I've had enough. I've said enough. <laughs> comments, comments, or.
just sharing some very interesting yeah. memories of it. <laughs> well, let's move on and then we'll send around some things because I think for some people who weren't around in those days, looking at this material can be quite strange, like you're being transported back into another age. As you've said, Jenny, one, one of the things about looking at the language and I've had a look at some of the essays that I wrote then and sometimes I, I can't believe that I wrote it and then I think, well, I understand why I wrote that at that point in time. And it's a really interesting challenge, I think, for a, a history project to work out how to think about what we were doing as a field and who was working outside of the officially recognised field also and how they were talking about literacy people. How the, how the language that we use was taken up and how we wanted people to take up that language too. So I'll go quickly through a couple of things and then, and then I've got a couple of things and you want to share some things too, don't you? Oh, so I'll just know. pass. These yeah. are just help yourselves. Um, I just wanted to remind us of a couple of things, not necessarily to talk about them, but to think about the organisational units. This was an official photograph that's made, made its way into a number of uh, TAFE newsletters uh, you know, and the, and the people there, um, I finally remembered that the chap second from left, second from your left too, was Mike Arlo. Yeah. And, that, and yet his name eluded me for many, many um, boxes <laughs> until I remembered it. So some of you might remember Bob Wilson who set up the um, Adult Literacy Unit in the Adelaide College. College of Further Education. Yeah as it was called. So the other thing as I listened to Jenny was thinking about how literacy has been absolutely woven in and, in and through TAFE's history, um, but also through community and neighbourhood houses, and then from 1991 or 92 onwards through VET, through what we now know as the VET system. But long before the VET system existed, I, I think the reason why I'm focusing on this particular unit is that a lot of people have no memory of TAFE being involved in a real, a, what was essentially a grassroots community movement. And, and so that unit did a whole range of things to the extent that one of the jobs that I had that I took over from Linda to do was driving around in a beaten up old Panama and going out and interviewing people in the dark, in, in, their, home. in their homes. <laughs> the, the things now that even yeah. now we occasionally shudder about and talk about in terms of industrial conditions and occupational health and safety but at another level it was geared towards a very different kind of thinking about how you connected with people and how you help them on a, on a path on the, the path the language now is getting people on pathways to employment the language then was was quite different um, so another um, unit that I remember really strongly was the literacy SA um, entity which only recently uh, stopped. Um, so that went on for a long time and it was quite distinctive. And I know that the Literacy SA email list had people from New Zealand and the UK and the Eastern States of Australia hooking into what we were doing here in, in South Australia. Um, the preview service, which was part of the Adelaide College of Tape. So I'm, I'm just picking out actually, these aren't picked for any particular reason, but to, in a sense, to kind of pique your interest in the ways in which various units and organisations have tried to support and publicly develop literacy. So the preview service actually... Um, it was mobile and used to was, go out into the region. I was going to say, Keita, why don't you tell us what it is, because I, can't, I don't want to read it there, but actually mm. did, it was mobile and it used to take materials out. Absolutely, yeah, in boxes and... Uh, yeah, it was only it was only disbanded a few years ago. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was the latter the part. It's, it was based in, in a corner of the Adelaide Tate Library for years. Yeah. Then it must have gone mobile yeah. after that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so these things also had a life of their own. They started with something, that, but then took up another um, way of responding to issues. Well, where did it go? I mean, the regions got where? Yeah. Two, oh, two. It was a preview service. So if you if you were um, out at Cooper PD or something like that, want to have a look at resources before you bought them. They would, you oh. just, they had a whole list and you tell them which ones you want to have a look at. They'd send it out in a box, you'd, you'd view it and send it back in a month's time. And you either order or not order wherever they came from. 
So it was just a really a service that was provided. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Almost a version of a mobile library. It was. But you could you could buy the materials too. You could actually check out whether they were going to be suitable for your, for your program. Yep. That's good. <coughs> um, I also remembered a committee that came out of the the acronym was Entails, which uh, was a it's federal government entails. Entails. <laughs> yeah, entails, entails. The National Collaborative Adult English Language and Literacy Strategy, uh, endorsed by Commonwealth, Minister, Commonwealth and State Ministers around about 1993. Uh, 93. By 1996, it had, it, it had met its demise. But in South Australia, the support from the State Government actually supported the committee that met through NCALS. And the, and the role of NCALS was to bring all of the range of ways in which literacy was being developed in the state and offered in the state together. And someone asked me, I think, in around 1996 or seven, to write, no, actually it was like 2004, to write a little piece on NCALS. And I had to try and think about where it came from and what its role was. And I remember, as one of the few university representatives on the committee, it was a meeting where everyone who delivered literacy in the state sat around the table. So you actually had people competing for funds who would sit around the table willing to talk about some of the issues. Now I, I know that that presents a, a fairly harmonious view of, of the committee. There were times when it got fairly tense and there were times when uh, some of the um, ways in which money was allocated were really brought up for contestation. But in my experiences with the East Coast, there were very few of the states who continued that NKL's impetus to say, we really need people who are delivering and providing support to get around the table and talk about how we're going to make the best of it for people in South Australia. So I found that quite interesting in something that, I, that um, was another way of organising more at the, the meta level of provision and across organisations rather than at the coalface in classrooms. State government activity. It was hard for me to find on the web something about the old adult community education unit, the ACE unit, which a number of people were really quite familiar with in through the mid 90s and the early 2000s. But the names also kind of shifted as the unit itself was positioned, then repositioned, then repositioned again within government agendas around employment, education, training, and in relation to schools. So there it was the ACE unit, and then it became ACE and Community Partnerships, I think. And of course, the person I remember most associated with that was Jan Peterson. Um, and then now, South Australia works in, in SA works in the communities. Whether it's necessarily taken over all of the roles of that previous unit, I think, I think there's a PhD itself in that, <laughs> that passage of different units and different state government engagement with literacy. Oh. Um, policy and strategy, very quickly, couldn't resist um, no. a very oh, interesting well, well, photo. <laughs> yes, the, the hair again, 19, uh, 1989. And the people yeah. from left, Barbara Mary. Now, Barbara's not a woman that uh, I'm familiar with. Maybe She was a tutor at Don't Give Us Pains. Right, mm. OK. Uh, Jackie, uh, Ruth Trenary, Jackie Parso, John, Don Strimple and Judy Waite. Why I put that in the policy and strategy was that this was in the lead up to International Literacy Year and it was taken at Gillis Plains at an event that Rosie Wickett spoke at. So we'd flown Rosie Wickett over. Rosie had developed, um, been instrumental in developing some of the national policy. She conducted the first national survey called No Single Measure in Adult Literacy. Um, and what she was saying was to take it on, uh, become advocates. Uh, she said that teachers who are advocates think about what materials they use and the values implicit in giving these materials to students. And that was a very strong message of hers, to actually think about how we advocated in, into policy, but also, as Jenny said, into the media. I was thinking numbers too. You can't do literacy without doing numeracy. And the numbers that were recycled in the late 80s and early 90s, the $3.2 billion cost of Ill illiteracy to industry was a number that was recycled again and again and again. One in seven people can't read. And the acronyms, and one of the powerful acronyms of those times was the 
alignment of the unions with, the, with what we often called an adult literacy movement. So there we've got, yet again, Linda Are making um, <laughs> an appearance. Um, quickly through, I was thinking policy and strategy, and, and this um, multi-literacy strategy, literacy is everybody's business, really caught up with a number of people on the, in, on the East Coast. They're quite interested in the way that a state would try and badge its state strategic action. And I noticed too that um, a lot of the funding for community education has come out of that multi-literacies framework of thinking about literacy. Um, lots to be said about that. Another PhD on a policy analysis of that in particular, just in case you're interested in taking one up. I'm going to go through quickly so this. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes, you can do it by distance through <laughs> Charles Darwin University. Um, I'm actually shameless. It's shameless, isn't it? <laughs> I'm going to go through this quickly, but the first slide I think is really important. This was around about 1979, and the first time I read this report, I saw Smith and Saunders and Smith, and I thought Andy Smith. Andy Smith wrote something, and I because Andy Smith was such a figure in the provision of adult literacy in the early times. But it was actually Chris Smith. Um, and I've spoken about this before. This project was completed, and Trish Branson was the first. I, I said, it's a very big project, and it was a, a research project on uh, apprentices and lecturers down at Croydon Park doing literacy. And I said, my mind boggles now about where the money came from to do this kind of project. There was no, nothing about funding in the usual acknowledgements at the front. And Trish reminded me that people do this, did this, in their daily work, that this was a project that an institute or a group of people would be able to say, well, we're going to try and work out how to do this as part of the work that we normally do. And what it was, was an interesting scale of five. Uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. So as I go through these slides, you'll see that the idea of scaling literacy and numeracy development for students through, you know, four or five or six numbers comes up repeatedly. Some of you have seen this before. South Australian based, sharing your assessment profiles in adult basic education in the late 80s. The interim literacy course matrix, long before the Australian core skills framework, long time before. And I just want to go back also to this project. Long before we were talking about integrated literacy in the mid 90s, there it was down at Croydon, people were trying to work on integrated literacy and as Jenny said also with the um, apprentices mm -hmm. out at Holden's. Some things don't go away. Mm -hmm. So the interim literacy course matrix was a, a as I understand it, a kind of pathways <coughs> mapping for students <coughs> and teachers. And I know that there are people in the room here today who had a lot of involvement in that. I'm whipping through these because I think we should have some time to talk. And so I come back again to Adelaide 1988, the National 2008 <coughs> uh, Interim Literacy, uh, sorry, the Australian Core Skills Framework. Another small project in terms of a comparative study would be really interesting to look at the basic principles of the um, assessment profiles in adult basic education and the language and then the core skills framework and what's going on with them now. Um, for me, I think it's a really interesting challenge to think about who, who tells history and what that history looks like. And I was looking at these photos of um, the DTAFE Literacy 18th Year Celebration in 1993. Um, in a lot of these photos, it's hard also to work out who the people are. I'm not sure who this woman here is. Megan. Megan Rose? No. Isn't it? Is it Megan? I thought it was Rose. Shirley, yeah. I know Margaret Corral. Oh, Shirley. Margaret, the Corn Shirley Cornish. Shirley Cornish. Cornish. Yeah. Cornish. Oh, Shirley Cornish. Okay. Yes. Oh, you're right. So I'm sorry. Shirley Cornish. <coughs> and I think this is Georgina New, which no. is what no, 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 no. I can't. No, 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 this is not Georgina. I just recently seen her. Definitely not Georgina. No, 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 it was Megan. Megan Fletcher. Shirley, I need to write these down because. So Shirley Cornish and Megan Fletcher. 
But my, my point of putting that slide up is I think there's some really interesting questions that Mary Hamilton and Yvonne Hillier have talked to me about and helped me think about. How do you tell a history? It can be shown through these documents. That's one way. Um, there's another way to show it through the kind of media images. And there are other ways, like Jenny's story tonight, like reflect oral, oral history, oral histories of people who look back over the, and I'm sure, Jenny, that you've got a dozen other stories, because as you spoke, I, I just started remembering a whole range of other people, tutor training, uh, TAFE Institute, senior managers who, ha who were incredibly powerful in getting literacy on track, some who were incredibly powerful in these kinds of things. So one of the real challenges with this particular project is to think about how to digitise material so it is available to a broader range of people. Um, so at the moment, this is still all up in the air. As I said, I've Josie's uh, colleagues at NCVER were incredibly generous last week in giving me some time to talk about how do you make decisions about what to digitise and how long does it take? And if you... I'm really happy for people... Oh, well, no, I won't stop there. I will say also, enormous number of issues about the ethics of collection of archives, the public dissemination of, of um, photos that haven't been officially uh, ratified or publicly disseminated huge issues about the, the um, dissemination of stories of students' work without either permissions or uh, public recognition that this is material that's available for publication. So there's lots and lots of work, work to do there, but I think, I think it's actually worth doing because I think there are a lot of very interesting stories to tell. So I've got um, a couple of things that I wanted to pass out and see what kind of responses people would make. Um, and I know that Jenny's got, who could send that one around and this one around too? Uh, Jackie's found my name on this book, which is Reading for Adults, which came from Giller Street, Reading Development. <coughs> it's one of those early resources that I had. I think it, I picked it up by mistake when we had our it doesn't matter. It'll just go in another no. box. Yeah, it's interesting. Because I've got another red one, obviously, and it must have got caught up. Mm. Some of these are um, assessment exemplars that Valda Davy and person's name is Skate. No, uh, Valda Davy and down south, uh, Jean, 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 Jean Routley. Uh, wrote about the CPE, the Certificate in Comparative Education. So some of those, and in fact I wasn't going to say that because I was interested in people who'd never heard of the CPE before, thinking where, you know, yes, and, and also how does it stack up against the ACSF now? If you've got a, a comment about an assessment piece now, would you, would you use that same kind of language in relation to this? So, I just want to ask, has anyone recorded um, the Ellen scale? Yes, 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 some tools survive and some have gone away. So for Sue, it will be something that people can check. Why some survive and boom and why some gone away. Yeah, okay. Because Ellen's game is quite similar. I can't, I, I, I've never tried it, but I can't recall what we, yeah, I think that's a assessment tool that we are all asking. For quickness to know, I deleted a lot of the slides. Slides, but the, 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 the ICLM, the Interim Literacy yes, yes. Force Matrix, the matrix then, then, then the Allen scale, scale, then the NRS, then the ACSF. That was the, the, the order history, that yeah. I The matrix, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> this is the, You're involved in the IRC. <laughs> this is just the something that I get. And Ellen's and scale was developed in the state. Yeah. I think it's not. Yeah. We just and it was developed yeah. by somebody who wasn't telling me in the group. I mean, that really there was a strong really professional move against it. And then the ILCM and what followed. NRS. Really, the NRS. And it was never published. No, so, yeah. I mean, no, the ACSS and the NRS is so much more complex. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah. It's got a history, really. But in 1990, there was all sorts of uh, um, uh, cartoons published about democracy. There were. So I think for the, for the sake of people who might be watching this in the ether, we'll close this now. But I'll, I want to thank Jenny. Um, I thanking Jenny for going down memory lane with this. It's been fantastic. And um, the other thing is that I don't know anyone who's got these kind of incredible, amazing scrapbooks. That I'm, I'm sure other, other people might have, but I've, I've just got a box of stuff that's been pushed into a filing cabinet. These scrapbooks are amazing. Totally well, they're not really, because I started my very first one in 1960, 1960 when I did my intermediate. They are and I have kept a journal of my life in, this is why we've got a big garage with lots of boxes. And when I was 60 and I was to give my, my speech, I carried the box out of all these books and I said, no, we we'll start in 1959. I've got every wedding invitation, 21st invitation, absolutely everything. It's just not good. <laughs> <laughs> so the kids say they don't want it, we don't want it, I'm just... No. But anyway, this is, this is good. That's in a very separate box, don't worry.